On Thursday this week, Pastor Jude, you know, was apparently he'd been trying to call me all week. And uh, I didn't have his number saved in my phone, so I never answered. And so he sent me a text and he said, Banky, this is Pastor Jude from TPH and uh, I need to speak to you today. So I, I called him immediately and, and he said, um, Banky, PT wants you to speak on Sunday. Um, I know some people are nervous already. <laughs> because I'm nervous too. <laughs> he said, PT wants you to speak on Sunday. Um, it's Culture Sunday and he wants to do something different and he feels like God, you know, just wants to disrupt things and do things a different way and... And I said, sorry, excuse me. You know, you know when you're nervous and your voice goes very light. I said, um, you know, are you sure you have the right number? You know, there are plenty of pastors in TPH. And um, he said, no, 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 you know, this is what it is. And you know, Pete is very wise because he didn't even call me himself because if he did, I would have begged my way out of it. But he sent Pastor Jude. So I called Pastor Jude back. I said, okay, so just first service. And he said, no, both services. I said, ah, Odaro, okay. And so when I hung up the phone, um, the first thing was panic, you know. I've spoken at a lot of conferences, but never in church on a Sunday morning for two services. And so I started thinking, I said, God, you know, you know, if this is what you want me to do, you, gotta, you give me two months notice. You know, let me go on a sanctified retreat, prayer, fasting, you know, receiving of ultra night vigil for two weeks straight. And God said, you know, yeah, that's if it was by your ability. But it's not about you. It's about my grace that will cover you. And there's a scriptural reference for this because Paul said, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I wrote this down. Sorry, this is my first time. But Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, 10, he said, For I am the least of the apostles. I am not worthy to be called an apostle. Because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And so ladies and gentlemen, you know, I haven't been to Bible school. I've not been to seminary. Um, I am not a pastor. I am just a work in progress child of God. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. And I'm here this morning. So I'm believing God that by that grace... Um, that there are some things that he wants to share with you through me and we will receive it this morning in Jesus name and so I want to start with a quick word of prayer Father God we give you praise and glory we magnify your holy name we exalt you we thank you for another Sunday we thank you Lord because we know that today will not be like any other Sunday oh God we won't do the same old things we won't hear the same old messages and remain the same but today you will activate the faith that you've placed inside of us oh God and that lives will be changed oh Lord breakthroughs will be received in Jesus mighty name and so Father God I submit myself as a vessel once again right now and I ask oh God that the words that I speak will be the words that you want your people to hear in Jesus mighty name Amen. So permission to proceed. Okay, let me start by issuing a very important disclaimer. And I said it before. I am not a pastor. And no, this is important. Because, you know, you, when you are working in the house of God amongst Christians, they immediately want to, ah, Pastor Banky. I'm not Pastor Banky. If you call me Pastor Banky, I will not answer you. Um, my name is Banky or Olu Bankole. Olubankole Wellington, and uh, I love my name. I love that name, Olubankole. And um, but before I tell you why, um, let's let's start in scripture. So the theme right now is uh, fearless finish, right? For the end of the year. So what that means is that God wants us to finish the year strong, to walk in faith, to to take steps that we've never taken before, to try things, to to move forward in faith and believe that it'll it'll happen. And we all know what the definition of faith is, right? Faith is the substance of things. Just because I'm not a pastor doesn't mean you should not answer me. <laughs> After all, I told the keyboardist to be here. They play small so they can hear you. So they feel like Pastor Tony is talking. <laughs> it said, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Thank you. So what that means to me, my interpretation of that and, and my belief of what faith is, Faith is believing that God can, trusting that he will, 
and then acting like it. So if you don't take anything from what I say today, it's that. Faith is believing that God can, trusting that he will, and then acting like it. Now, you know, at the point of salvation, you need faith, right? To receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because the Bible says, by grace, we are saved through faith. So you need faith. You know, those that come to God must first believe that he is. So, so for you to accept Jesus Christ, you need faith. The problem is a lot of people in church, a lot of Christians have the faith to receive God and then stop there. And so we stop at the point of faith for salvation. But the truth is that's only step one. That's not, that's not the, it's, it's not just about believing God that you make heaven. There are a lot of people that will make heaven, but will not live lives that please God. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so let's get into it. In the book of Mark chapter 11, verse 20. So a little bit of background. Jesus is walking with the disciples and he's hungry. And he comes upon a fig tree and he goes to it to get some fruit. And the fig tree had no fruit. So Jesus spoke to the tree and he said, Your curse, nobody will ever eat your fruit again. You're done. Goodbye. Thank you. Good night. You know, I thought it was a little harsh, but hey, it is what it is. And so we pick up in verse 20, please. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Tell your neighbor, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. And so if you are going to title my message today, it would be reinstilling hope and reactivating faith. And I think a good place to start is where Jesus said that if you have faith, whatever you say, if you believe in your heart, if you say it, it will be done. Amen? So when I was a kid, uh, you know, I can't remember exactly how old I was, but I remember the day that it hit me that my father's name is Bankole, but my name is Olu Bankole. Now, you know, in Yoruba culture and, and a lot of other cultures, when a son is being named after a father, usually they just give him the same name and say, Shegun, Shegun Junior, Tunde, you know. But I realized that there was a distinction between what my father was called and what my parents decided to call me. And so I went to my mom one day and I said, why did you add Olu to my name? For people that don't understand Yoruba, it means God will help me build my house. And so I went to my mom and I said, well, why did you add Olu? Why didn't you just call me what my father was called? And she said, it's because we wanted to speak prophetically over your life. That it is God that will build your house. That it is God that your help will come from. We didn't want just to call you anything. Run, help, task, help, anybody help me, bang, call it. No, God will help me build my house. And at the time I was a young kid and you know, my parents are very blessed and, and, and very fortunate now. But at the time we were not as well to do um, at that age. And you know, you don't really notice things. You know, when you're a kid, you just, you're just living and you know, whatever environment that is around you is the environment that you grow up in. So my parents had to make some very hard choices at that time because they couldn't, you know, they weren't quite where they are now. You know, they were still kind of coming up. So they, they decided to invest in our education. And so we went to the best of schools, but we didn't live in the best of neighborhoods. And so as a kid, you know, I would, I would go to Corona Ikoi, and then I would come back to our apartment in uh, Akoka Yaba. Now, we were living in an apartment that was sinking. So the building itself was sinking. So you know in Lagos, in rainy season, when the floods, you know, take over the streets, the floods actually used to come into our apartment. So we didn't used to, to leave electronics on the floor because they would get ruined. So everything 
that was of value or whatever, you had to put it above a certain height so that when the rains come, before we go to school and work in the morning, we would actually go to the living room and take buckets and scoop the water out. And my mom became a Christian pretty early on in my life. So she started saying, okay, we must do family altar. How many people did family altar at home? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, so we do family altar every morning and every night. And I will never forget, all through my years as a child, one of the number one prayer requests was that God would bless our family with our own home. And we prayed it every morning and every night. So in my mind as a child, owning a home became the symbol that we are successful or safe or secure. Because we prayed about it every day. But then one day it was a friend's um, birthday and my parents let me go to his house and it was a friend that I went to Corona Ikoi with and so his family lived in Ikoi and I got into the compound and I saw a swimming pool. Now at the time I didn't know that people could have swimming pool in the compound. I'm telling you, it sounds funny now, but you know, as a child, you know, you know, Unilag pool, you know, Ikoi club where the community comes and we all enjoy the big pool together. But I didn't know that people could be so well to do that you could have a swimming pool in the compound. So I'm growing up and uh, all through my growing up years, I would always hold on to my name as a prayer point. And I would say, God, my name is Olubankole. It's a prophecy. People have been calling me this all my life. So you must do what my name says. You must help me build my house. And so that day when I saw my friend's house and I saw the swimming pool in it, I got back home in the evening and I went back to my mom. And I said, mommy, when God blesses us with a house or when God gives me a house, do you think it can have a swimming pool? And she said, my son, and thank God for parents that instill certain principles in us. She said, son, whatever you ask, if you believe in God, he can do it for you. So whatever you want in your house, just include it in your prayer as you are praying to God. So I went back to God. I said, God, when you give me my house, I need a swimming pool. <laughs> and that's how I would go. And, and I kid you not, as I was growing up over the years, every time that I would get to a building and I found something that I liked, I added it to the prayer points. So first it was a swimming pool. And then, you know, when I happened to go back to New York, I saw townhouses, you know, the ones with like um, three, three levels, ground floor, first floor, second floor. I said, oh, a townhouse would be nice. Okay, townhouse with swimming pool. And then I would go to a hotel and I, saw, I, I stayed in a hotel once and they had, you know, one side of the room, they had these accent walls that have uh, exposed brick. I said, okay, swimming pool, exposed brick. And then I went to an apartment and I saw very tall ceilings. I said, ah, God, add this one too. Tall ceiling, uh, exposed brick, swimming pool, townhouse. God bless you. So when I went to New York and I was about 18 years old, my very first job in life was in McDonald's. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know McDonald's, it's like Mr. Biggs. Um, at the time, I had gone back to New York and, you know, I, I was doing my senior year of high school. And I didn't want, to, you know, it's tough on parents who send their children to go and live with people it's a very tough thing because financially it's straining emotionally it's straining you know if a child is not living at home it's just not going to be the most ideal of situations and i didn't want my parents to feel that pain so every time they would ask me i say oh, i'm fine i'm fine don't worry so i got there and i knew that i needed to make money very quickly so I started going to all the clothing stores that I could find and, you know, I, nobody would give me a job. And, you know, on break, I went to a McDonald's to eat and I saw a now hiring sign and I said, okay, maybe let me just get this job. And as I was filling my application, the manager just called me and said, hey, you look like a correct young man. If you want a job, you can come start right now. So you, anybody remember Eddie Murphy and coming to America? That was me. And so I'm in the, you know, I'm in the kitchen, you know, flipping burgers and and cleaning and you know I would go to school so I was living with a family that they were kind enough to allow me stay there but they didn't really want me there it was almost out of duty and responsibility it's in the little things that you realize you're kind of a second-class citizen so you can stay in the house but we won't give you a key we won't tell you the code to the garage door we'll tell our children not to tell you so you know when you're not feeling that love and support at home 
you avoid home as much as possible. So I would go to school from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. Then I would leave school, go to McDonald's, eat lunch, do my homework, start work, and work until closing and eat dinner there. I ate McDonald's every day for a year. Just imagine like meat pie, Mr. Biggs, every day, afternoon, night. You know, if anybody has ever worked in like a Mr. Biggs or a McDonald's or a fast, it's a tough job. You're on your feet all day. You come home, you're smelling like fat and grease and oil. But now you couple that with the fact that you are walking, you know, because when, when the, the, the neighborhood that we lived in, when it gets too late, the buses stop. So if you close the restaurant after the bus has stopped for the day, you're walking 40, 45 minutes home in the winter in the snow. And there were, I'll never forget, there was a day, there was a day that I came home, I think maybe I didn't have, I don't remember, but I, I came home and because I didn't have a key, I didn't even realize that the family had gone out and they gave me no notice, no call, no, just locked the house and it's the middle of the winter to the point where I got so cold, I was walking up and down just to stay warm. It got, I was, I literally was freezing, I thought I would catch pneumonia. A neighbor saw me walking and said, young man, come, what are you doing walking in this kind of weather? And I said, oh, the family I'm staying with have locked me out. I don't know where they are. And so that's the kind of year that it was. It was tough. It was hard. I was, I was working and I, you know, and I'll never forget. I knelt down and I prayed and I said, God, this job that is, you know, this, this, this current state of life that I'm in and this job that I'm working in that one day, I must own my own McDonald's. I must own my own restaurant because I can't be going through all of this. Now, rewind back to when I was a kid. I'll never forget one night I had a dream. And in the dream, I owned a restaurant. And I didn't remember the details of the dream, but I remember people were eating burgers. And they were very happy. And it was just this restaurant and people would keep coming. And it was this small little shack. And I woke up and I went to my mom again and I said, mom, I dreamt this and this and this. And my mom said, you know, when God gives you dreams like this, maybe he's telling you something that's going to be in your future. So hold on to it. So now fast forward, I'm 18 years old working in McDonald's. And I said, okay, is the restaurant that I'm going to own, is this McDonald's that I'm going to do? So I worked in McDonald's for two years and, uh, and then I moved on and I did other things. And, um, you know, so that was my life. So I, so I finished from McDonald's. I went to university. I was studying and all of that good stuff. And uh, eventually I made it through school. You know, God blessed me with scholarships and loans and things of that nature. And, you know, I, I got my engineering degree. And I graduated from school. And I got a job in an engineering company. And, you know, it, it felt like, you know, now that I have a good job, everything is okay. My first year out of university, I was making over a hundred thousand dollars as a young man. So it was like, okay, you know, I'm here. I've made it. Thank God we're fine. But you know, when you are not where God wants you to be, when you're not fulfilling purpose, you don't feel comfortable. You don't feel satisfied. You don't feel fulfilled. So it's not a money thing. It's a purpose thing. It's not, you know, you saw the video from Waterbrook. It's not about how much money you make. It's about, are you where God wants you to be? Are you doing what he wants you to do? So I'm sitting there and, you know, you know, I, I have a good job. I'm making this salary, but I was unhappy. I was, I was frustrated. I was, I just, this, this is not meant to be my life. And I would remember that when I was a child, I had dreams of music and movies and speaking and business and the restaurant and all of these things that I wanted to do and by this time I had started releasing music you know now and then and my music has started growing and I just kept feeling an urge that I was supposed to come back to Nigeria and so I called my folks up one day and I said you know I'd like to move back to Nigeria and, and face my music full-time my parents almost lost their minds I know it's different now because the music business and the movie business now has shown signs of life. We praise God for people like Auntie Joke that opened the door for us. But you know, there was a time that you cannot go to a Nigerian parent and say you want to do, do what? <laughs> so, so when I tried to have the conversation, 
My mother said, you want to sing? Sing in New York City. There's a music business. What are you going to Nigeria to do? It's not safe. It's this, it's that. You finally have a job. You finally did all of it. So you want to leave all of this to go and start again and do what? And I had a conversation, you know, my mom was a little emotional at the time. So I called my dad and I said, you know, I can't explain it. And I couldn't explain it because it wasn't a money thing. It wasn't about the fact that I finally had a job that was paying me. It's a purpose thing. When you're not where you are meant to be, when you're not following your purpose, when you're not chasing after the dreams that God has placed inside of you, you will never be happy. No matter how much money you make or money you're not making, it's a purpose thing, not a pay thing. And so I had that conversation with my dad and I said, you know, I need to know that I tried. I need to just follow my heart and follow what I've, what I've always been dreaming about. I just need to get it out of my system that I've tried. And if I go for a year and a half and it doesn't work, I'll leave it, I'll come back to America, I'll get a master's, I'll get another job, no problem. But let me even know that I tried. So my parents gave me their blessing and said, go. So this is 2008. So 2008, Valentine's Day, I bought a one-way ticket and I quit my job and I moved back to Nigeria. Now, that 2008 year was, again, a very tough year because, you know, in entertainment, fame comes way before fortune. So the minute you have a video on TV, you, have, you are a star. Anything for your boys. You know, anywhere you go, people recognize you. And so all of the money that I had saved up to come and attack this dream of you know, being a musician and owning a label and all, everything that I had saved, I spent in 10 months on videos, on photo shoots, on DJs, on this, and nothing, I, was, I didn't earn one penny from this same thing that I was chasing, one. To the point that by the end of the year, come November, December, I was so broke that I was borrowing 5K from my manager who, who was kind enough to give me a place to live and a car to drive. I was borrowing 5K to put fuel in the car and to buy recharge cards just to get around and take my music to radio stations. And uh, you know, towards the end of that 2008 year, December 31st, you know, my mom raised me to bring in the new year in the house of God. So I went to church. And uh, you know when you are so when you are so frustrated that this thing is not working, that you start writing your prayer points for the new year inside the Bible and you lay your hand on the Bible that this is what's going to happen to me this year. 2009 is my year. It's going to work. My destiny, my music, you know. And I left church. I, I brought a friend to church with me and afterwards I drove to the island. So my church was on the mainland. It was Fountain. Um, and then I drove to the island to drop my friend with her family. And then at the time, if anybody remembers, you know, things are better. We're not where we want to be as a country yet or as a state yet, but they're better now. But back then, there were no street lights. There were, you, you know, if you are, they, they always used to warn you that if you are going to the island um, overnight, don't cross that mainland bridge overnight. Wait until it's daylight before you go back because arm robbers would set stuff on the road. So I had dropped her off and uh, I was looking at my time. It was past one in the morning. I said, okay, let me kill three, four hours until it's daylight. So I called some friends that lived on the island and I said, where are you guys? Let me come and chill with you small until it's bright out. And on getting to where they were, I parked my car and I came out of the door and I felt somebody slap me. Bah! I turned, I saw four armed robbers. I said, I said maybe they want this is my car. By the way, the car broke down everywhere possible in Lagos. I'm telling you, Awolo War Road, Lekki, VI, Ikech, anywhere that you can imagine, the car broke down everywhere. But it's what I had to get around. In fact, when the car would break down, the uh, conductors and area boys would see me and say, ah, Ebutemeta, what happened? Oh yeah, then they'll help me push. So, <laughs> <laughs> give God glory for my life please <laughs> so uh, so I felt the slap I looked up I saw the armor but I said the car is cuckoo useless anyway I said oh yeah I got take they said who wants your car bah bah 
pushed me in the back seat of my car and the four of them jumped in the car with me and drove off. So I'm sitting there in the back seat and you know when you feel like, when you're in so much shock that you're having an out of body experience, you're, it's like you're watching a movie of yourself. So I felt like I was on top of the car looking down like, okay, they're beating me, they're robbing me, they've taken my watch, they've taken my shoe, they've taken my cap, they took my phone, everything, money, they're, they're like, you look like you just came from America. Where are the dollars? Where are they? I said, Baba, I live in this Lagos with you. I don't have. And so all of this is going on and uh, I'm just kind of watching what's going on to me. And then I hear the driver say to the guys who were seated on either side of me. And he says, in Yoruba, my pronunciation for Yoruba is not great. But he says, Shoti Sheton. The guy says, yes. Which means, have you finished? The guy says, yes. He says, Jack Belosi Aja Kalokpa, which means let's take him to Aja and kill him. So, you know, first I was watching film of myself. <laughs> but when you hear certain things, your survival instincts kick in. So I snapped, I said, Take who to. I turned to the guy by my left. I said, Bros, please, Joe. He said, Shut up, shut up. If you say anything here, I'll shoot you in this car. Shut up. Sit down and shut up. <sighs> I turned to the other guy. I said, Egbo. This is a guy that was my mate or my junior. I said, Egbo. That's big brother. I said, please. I said, you don't need to do this. <laughs> and uh, he goes, shut up, shut up. I said, I said, bros. I said, look at my face. I said, you know me, you know me. He said, from where? I said, musician. I'm a musician. He said, musician. I said, yes. He said, Ori Woloko, like, which song did you sing? I said, ah, Ebute Meta. Uh, capable. I said, oh, Mr. Capable. He said, Mr. Capable. I said, Emini, Mr. Capable. I'm, I'm the one. I'm the one that sang it. And the guy looks at me, you know, he's in a kind of a drug-filled haze, and he looks at me with his gun in my face, and he says, ah, Mr. Capable. I say, yes. He says, oh, yeah, Corrin, yeah, Corrin. Sing, sing, sing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I gave the best free show I've ever given in my life. <laughs> Voice trembling, shaking, cold sweats, I said, from a boot, a meta, meta. So I'm just thinking that maybe the guy will hear it. So by this time, they had pulled out on Ozumba and Badi Way, presumably to, this is now like two o'clock in the morning, to, to, to dash towards Aja. And the driver just blurts out to, um, the guy who I had been <laughs> negotiating with and performing for, blurts to the driver, make this right, make this right. That's by the mobile. And so the car is speeding and he, cuts the wheel, I thought the car would, would flip over. And as I'm pulling up, there's another car. He says, oh yeah, let's take them, let's take them. So they screech in front of the car. The other car stops out of shock. And then three of them hop out and go and rob this other couple. So I'm sitting there in the car. Driver is here. Three people are robbing the other car. I say, if police come now, they will shoot and say they killed five armed robbers. I'm a hostage. I'm not a... So I talked to the driver. I said, bros, you guys are very busy. You understand? I don't want to be a distraction. So let me come down. You're, you know, so I can stay. The guy said, shut up. If you move, I'll kill you now. Just shut up and sit down. You are with us. I said, okay. So I sat there. And I watched this two, three minute operation of them robbing them for everything they're worth. And then they take the key of their car. And then they come back in the car with me and they drive again. You know... It's at this time that you start to remember the things your mother taught you. And in family altar, I remember morning and night all through my childhood, Psalm 91. We that dwell in the secret place of the most. So I said, you know, Banky, you have been talking to the wrong people all along. I'm supposed to be talking to God. So I put my head down and I said, we that dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty who we'll say of the Lord is our refuge and our fortress, our God in you do we trust. And then I would look up and I would see the gun and I start again, we that dwell in the secret place. <laughs> um, so I'm, you know, I'm going through this and then the guy nudges me and he goes, capable, capable. And I look up, he said, Farabale, Farabale, calm down, we're not going to kill you. I said, we that dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I'm not trying to talk to you. Don't, don't be by yourself. So I'm saying, you know, I'm saying Psalm 91 and, and I'm praying and I'm, 
And I'm thinking and I'm, I'm telling God, I said, God, this cannot be the end of my story. This, this is not where it's meant to end. Um, and, and, and ironically, if just a week or two before that, I had been hanging out with Two-Face. And he was sharing his armed robbery story when they shot him. I said, God, I'm not meant for bullets. They don't shoot. I'm a lover. I'm not a... I'm not a... You understand? So anyway, so I'm praying. And then the... Uh, you know, the, the, the guy who I had been kind of engaging with the whole time tells the driver, no, we're not taking him to Ajay. Drive here, drive here. So they go down Legali Ayorinde. At the time, Oniru didn't have, um, it was called VI extension. You know, there was a lot of uncompleted buildings, no lights. It was just a lot of construction. So they are pulling there and, you know, and uh, I, so, so we pull up to like these bushes and stuff. And he says, oh, everybody come down, come down. So we all come down from the car. And he goes, Capable, do you want your car? I said, no. You can have it. I just want to go home. And he goes, don't worry, don't worry. We can connect Aja from here. So he takes the key from the driver and he tosses it over my head. And he says, pick up your key, enter your car and be going. I said, you know, now I'm standing here. There are four armed robbers in front of me with gun. And my key is somewhere in the sand. So I said, let me just keep them in my sight and be stepping back like they because if they want to shoot me maybe i can do like a matrix or you know just you know you have to survival instinct so i'm doing that and then he goes to me he says in yoruba i've told you to enter your car and be going but you are here looking at my face if you want us to start making noise now we can make noise i said bros no vex let me just find i turned to find my key in the ground and by the time i looked up they had disappeared that's not the end of the story i get home and you know, for the first couple of days, I'm in shock, right? Because I'd just been staring down a gun for 45 minutes or thereabout. And it was one of the most harrowing experiences of my life. And I'm sitting there in the room and the caretaker of my manager's house comes with his son to the room. And he's slapping, he said, stupid boy, stupid boy, bah, bah. He says, sir, I'm so sorry. My son got drunk, entered this same car, which they didn't even know that I had gotten robbed in it. He said, he got drunk, he entered your car and scaled over a neighbor's wall and bashed the car into a neighbor's wall. Sc scaled over the gutter, I'm sorry. Scaled over the gutter, bashed the car into the neighbor's wall with a Nepal pole hanging on top of it. So now I'm broke. My music is not working. I'm not getting booked for shows. I've, I'm, I'm, I was literally at the end. I told you I went to church and I prayed in the new year that God show me you know, a, a way out of this. Now, my only means of transportation, which, by the way, broke down everywhere in Lagos, is now totaled. And I have explanation I'm begging to do to somebody else in the estate. See, eh? <laughs> depression is very real. Now, I've lived a very interesting life and I've been through some very interesting things. And I'm going to write a book one day by the grace of God. But I had never felt lower than at this very point. Because even when I was diagnosed with skin cancer, I've battled cancer three times to the glory of God and I'm still here standing with you and I'm healed in Jesus' name. But even when I battled that, it didn't really phase me because I, I felt like, man, God has a purpose for my life. I'm not the one that brought it here. I'm not the one that's going to remove it. God will give me the resources to pay for my treatment. It will be well in Jesus' name. I did, it didn't shake me as much as it shook my family. But this one shook me. You know why? Because when you are, sometimes when you are in a sunken place, every negative thing that anybody has ever told you will start to play back in your mind. And you start to say, man, maybe that was God telling me not to come to this place. But me with my stubborn big head, I dragged myself here. Now look at it. And I'm sitting there, you know, depressed and shaking. And, but you know, sometimes hitting rock bottom is a fantastic thing because when you are there there's nowhere else to go but up the bible says having done all to stand stand therefore sometimes the only thing that separates those who become successful who see their dreams come true is just the ability to hold on just a little bit longer sometimes that's all it is sometimes it's, yes it didn't work everything is terrible it's over at, Stay there and just, just take a step out of that place where you are. Just take. 
So, I, I spoke with my manager. You know, we said, okay, we can either throw in the towel now or we can just try again. And so we said, okay, what do we want to do? I said, I want to work with Kobams because I had met Kobams before. We'd done some commercial work. And I said, I want to record with him. So I called Kobams' office. He said, uh, is this amount? Kobams is a very nice guy, but it's very expensive. <laughs> um, so we went and borrowed the money for me to record with Kobams. And the first song that Kobams and I put together was a song called Strong Ting. Now, I know we're in a spiritual setting, but you can like love songs. You understand? And that song was the beginning of my turnaround and my dreams coming true because it was one song and then another and then now the kid who would be begging to perform or begging for an opportunity now people started saying okay where is that boy that sings that -na -na -na. call him call him give him this amount let him come and sing the song here and you know one thing led to another and I started to see success and I started to see things happen for me and then as I would make money I would reinvest it in the business we signed some artists we'd invest it in them and I think back now and I know that I came this close to everything that has happened with me with anybody associated with EME that entire chain of success and empowerment and all of that if I had just given up on it would have disappeared from that moment and that's what faith is Faith is the ability to just hold on a little longer. Faith is the ability to take a step, even when it feels like you should just throw in the towel. And so, you know, I started making music again and we, we recorded a new album. It started doing well. You know, they started actually calling me to perform. I started making some small money and anytime I would make money, I would reinvest it in the business. So immediately I got to a place of success. People can bear me witness. I took anything that I would make and I found artists to sign and then I would invest it in them and then as they became successful we would take that money and reinvest it again so now I'm in Nigeria a few years later there's a little bit of success I have some endorsement deals life is okay but then I started thinking I said man you know one of my biggest fears was that after all of this fame and being on TV and all of that I'd have nothing to show for it so now I'm in my 30s and I still don't have that house. Because, you know, every time you would make some money, whether it's from an endorsement or shows or whatever, you know, an artist, would, one of my artists would need an album launch or somebody would need to go and shoot a video in South Africa or something. So there was always a reason why I needed to spend the money that I was saving. And so it got to the point, it's about 2015, 2016, I started saying, I started praying that prayer from my childhood again that God, this house, this, my name is Olubankole, that's my prophecy and I'm holding on to it and you will do it. So I started saving my money again. So anytime I would make money, I would send it to an account that I did not even control and I had no access to. So it got to the point where it was, wasn't all the money I needed. It was maybe about 30, 40% of the value of the kind of house that I wanted to live in, in the kind of neighborhood that I wanted to live in. And because I had had relationships, you know, now I'm in entertainment for a while, so I knew people in the banking sector. Mm -hmm. So I went to them and I said, can you give me a mortgage? Can I, you know, get a, a house loan? You know, this is my income. This is what I've saved. So they said, okay, we'll work on it. So they were putting together a package for me. And I saw, I, I think I must have seen over 50 houses in Lekki phase one, because that's where I wanted to be. I'd gone and seen house after house and it's either I wouldn't like it or it would be way out of my price range. And then when the bank now came back with the terms of the mortgage, I'm sorry, apologies to any bankers here. You people know how you are. I saw the terms of the mortgage. I was going to be paying for a house for 20 years. I would end up paying three times more by the time it was done. But I said, you know, I'm going to have faith. God will bring the money. I'll find a way. And so I found this house, the owner had died and you know, there were some cracks in the wall because the house had been empty for a couple of years, but it was a nice house, you know, it was, it was okay. And I said, okay, this is the house for me, you know. So where's the pack? So the bank started working on the paperwork. And then in that time, my mom came to visit and we walked around the house and prayed and we said, oh father, you know, you know when you take your shoes off that I'm taking this ground as a possession. 
you come with anointing oil. You anoint all the entrances. I'm telling you. So we walked to the house, did full prayer session. The security guy was just looking at us like, ah. So we did all of that. And then my mom left the country. As she landed in Yankee, she called me. She said, Banky, that's not the house for you. I said, this woman has come again. When I wanted to move to Nigeria, she said I should not go. Now she's telling me I should not get the house. After I've been searching for how long, I've seen 50 something, I finally, I said no. I said, I said, okay, I'll pray about it. I'll get back to you. I kept moving. The bank put together the paperwork. By the time the paperwork came, okay, when my mom told me that, my prayer to God was that, God, if indeed this isn't the house for me, then let it not work out. But if it is, please let all things work together for my good. Now, by the time the bank came back with the paperwork, the owner had sold the place. And I was so sad. You know, you worked on something, you've saved, you've Trek, you real estate agent after real estate, I had seen and done everything and then the house disappeared, you know, before my eyes. And so I went back to prayer, you know, and by this time I had met what would become the best decision I've ever made in my life. Well, second best decision. The first decision is, you know, having a relationship with God. The second best decision is marrying my wife. Hallelujah. You can clap for that. So by this time I had met my wife and I knew that she was my wife. And I went back to God in prayer and I said, God, I, you know, I want to have a house that I'm moving this, your daughter into. And so when I was praying these prayers and I was really frustrated, you know, sometimes God doesn't give us the answer that we want. Or sometimes the devil brings a counterfeit of the promise of God and we give into it because we're in a hurry. Because we want it the way that we want it, when we want it, on our own terms and conditions, but that's not how God works. And so, I'm saying these prayers and, and I heard God, I felt like I heard God say to me, he said, but son, you asked me to help you build a house. You didn't ask me to help you buy one. He said, you specifically said, God, my name is Olubang Kole, help me build. He said, so how do you ask me something for 30 something years? Now you want a different version of what you've asked me for. He said, you even gave me specifications and you want me to let you go and do it. He said, no. So I said, okay, no problem. I went back to the drawing board. And then a, a, a real estate developer who I had met months earlier called me one day and he said, Banky, you found a house, right? I said, no, I'm still searching. He said, oh, okay, that's interesting because he just got a call and somebody in Lekki needed money and he's going to sell a portion of his land and that he wants to buy the land and build. And the interesting thing about that was, Panky, you don't even need all the money for the building. Just bring, how much do you have? I said this. He said, okay, let's do an off-plan payment structure. So as we're building, as you get money, just be paying it off. So now... There goes the 20 year mortgage, right? Now here's the other thing, instead of buying it, now I'm building it. I asked him, I said, oh, so I get to, he said, yeah, you can design it. We'll build it any way that you want. I said, please, can I have internal brick on some of the walls? He said, yes. I said, okay. I said, can it be a tall, you know, high ceilings? He said, your house will be the tallest house on the block. I said, father, I said, can I have a swimming pool? He said, he said, well, you could, but you're going to lose parking space. At the moment, you'll have parking for four to five cars. If you put a pool in, you'll only be able to park two. I said, my brother, put the swimming pool there. <laughs> because I've been having conversations with my father, and this is what we've agreed. I said, ladies and gentlemen, we started the, the building project. A few months into it, you know, when you're anybody that's taking on something like a wedding or a house, that year, I was trying to build a house and we were going to get married. Bad 2017. Anybody remember that? So we were going to get married in November and I was still building the house. So it was very tough on me financially. And about maybe June or, or May, there about halfway through the year, we get a call one day and the telecoms company that myself and many entertainers had endorsement deals with called us in for a meeting. Apparently, the company had fallen afoul of federal government rules and had got slammed with a fine. And so, you know, when a company takes that kind of hit, 
the first thing they look to do is, okay, how do we cut costs? And the first thing to go is usually entertainment, marketing, you know, all the serenity. So they called all the ambassadors in and they said, guys, sorry, we love you. You've done fantastic work, but your endorsement deals are over. And they fired 80% of the ambassadors overnight. Now, if you know anything about the music business, you know that musicians make their money from endorsements and performances. And so here I was trying to build a house, trying to figure out how to pay for a wedding. And a third, at least, if not more, of my income vaporized, disappeared overnight. And the project had already started. So I went back to God. I said, God, I said, you said he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor. I found the wife. I need the favor now. Because what am I going to do when it's time to make the next payment? And I just kept praying. And I, you know, the developer would say, okay, this is the payment. I said, no problem. So I would pay what I had. I said, oh, I'm coming, you know. And I'm sitting there one day. And we get a call. A lady that I had met maybe six months ago, randomly in another country, at an after party of my best friend's wedding, called us. She said, hey, I work with the Ministry of Tourism in this country, and we're thinking of doing something different and approaching Africa and Nigeria. Can we work together on something? So we start putting together like an influencer program and all the things that we would do for them. Guys, the money that we made from that deal was almost double what I had lost in the endorsement. I finished that one. I finished that one. I, I literally, I had not been back in Nigeria one week. We got another call. They said, ah, Coca-Cola wants to shoot a commercial. Can you travel to Barcelona next week? I say, I'm available. They say, okay, these and these are the terms. We negotiated. A week later, I'm off to Barcelona, Spain. I shoot a Coke commercial. I come back. Now, the money that I was worried about, triple had come back. And in March 27th last year, my birthday, we moved in to our very first home. Complete with brick, complete with high ceilings, complete with swimming pool. Now that's not the end of my story, but you can give God glory for that. So fast forward to this year, and uh, you know, I'm on the campaign trail, and one day we were hungry, and um, somebody said, oh, there's this place. They serve nice sandwiches. Let's just buy food from there. So we sent somebody to buy the food. And I tasted it, and I said, man, this is incredible. You know, they, they take suya, and they make burgers, and all of these things about it. Now, let me rewind you back 30-something years. Not even when I was 18. When I was a kid, one day I had a dream. And in the dream, I knew that I owned a restaurant. And in that restaurant, people were coming to order burgers and other sandwiches. And I woke up and I went and told my mom. I said, mom, I dreamt this. She said, that means God is telling you that somewhere in your future, maybe you're going to own a restaurant. So write it down. Think about it. How is it going to look? What's it going to be? So I even gave the restaurant a name. I was a kid. I said, oh, Burger Paradise. Because the one thing I remember is that people were eating burgers and sandwiches. Now I'm on the campaign trail, January of this year. And I eat this sandwich, and it's a suya burger, and it tasted amazing. And I said, ah, where is this from? We started ordering it two, three times a week, like all through the campaign trail. I now said one day, I said, ah, who owns this business? Apparently, it was a girl who had come to pitch me about something else a year ago. We didn't end up doing that plan. But guess what? I called her up. I said, you know, she said, oh, it's just me. It's her little baby. I said, this thing is not a baby. This thing is... <laughs> so we had a conversation. We put heads together. We worked out the terms of our partnership. And when I was 18, working in McDonald's, sweating, smelling of grease and fat and all of these things, I said in prayer, in faith, that God, one day, you will give me my own McDonald's for this thing that I'm going through. I didn't know that 20 years later, I would own co-own the McDonald's of Suya. That it wasn't about owning McDonald's, it was about owning something else that was uniquely ours and uniquely Nigerian. And God needed me to start in McDonald's to learn the skill set necessary to run this kind of franchise. So sometimes, whether you are working for minimum wage, whether you are 
working some menial job, you are, you are starting out and it looks like your dreams are so far out of reach. I was 18. I knew I wanted to sing. I knew I wanted to do movies. I knew I wanted to own a restaurant. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm 38. I've sunk. I've made movies. I own a restaurant. God listens and God answers prayers. Now the key in all of this, as I bring this to a close, the key in all of this is about faith. It's about what you say. Tell your neighbor, watch what you say. It's about what you say. It's about seeing it before you see it. It's about what you say, what you see, what you believe, what you are willing to walk on, the steps of faith that you are willing to take. In the Bible, we know of the story of the woman with the issue of blood. She'd suffered with that condition for 12 years. Now, in those times, to my understanding, when a woman, you know, was going through her period or whatever, she's considered unclean. Now, this woman had been going, had been in this unclean state for 12 years. Now, women that, ha that have tough periods, imagine that that never ends. You are in pain, you feel unclean, and, and it's not just about physical pain, but it's about sometimes in our lives, we're in pain. We're going through things. We feel pain, we feel unclean, we feel dirty, we feel like God has forgotten us. But you know what? That woman said to herself that I'm going to go I'm not even going to go for a conversation or to tell him about my story. She said I'm just going to touch the hem of his garment. Jesus is in a throng of people. People are pushing him left, right and center. Prayer requests, healing this, that, whatever. This woman didn't even have direct contact. She just said and as soon as she did that Jesus said what? Who touched me? They said, people are pushing you left. What do you mean who touched you? Well, everybody's touching you. He said, no. Somebody's faith. You know when God is answering prayers, sometimes he's not answering the request in the prayer. He's activated by the faith. It's the faith that he's responding to. Not the request. There are a lot of requests. Everybody has problems. But are you willing to not only believe that he can, because we all know that he can, are you willing to trust that he will? Are you willing to act like it in your state? Despite what you are going through, despite how wretched you may feel, despite the mistakes you've made, despite whatever breakthrough that you are believing God for, are you willing to take steps of faith? Are you willing to go to Jesus and say, let me just touch the hem of his garment? Ladies and gentlemen, my life, I'm not by any stretch of the imagination a perfect man. But I am a work in progress. And by God's grace, I'm a man of faith. And that's what I want to leave you with today. What is that thing that you've forgotten about? Like my restaurant dream. Like my music dream. That it's, it seems so far from your reality. I believe that God wants us to start hoping again. I believe that God wants you to. There's some dreams that you've, you've let go of. He's asking you to bring it back. And have some faith. Come in this, come as you are with all of your problems and your baggage and your bleeding. Come as you are and just take a step of faith.